And I share this openly because I want moms to know that like those first six months can be extremely tough. If you have a challenging baby, it's also such a big learning curve with feeding, with sleep, with all of those things. And just having all the feelings are totally normal. Um, but I want you to know that I'm now well rested. And I want you to know that in this state of sleep deprivation, um, where you're feeding in the nighttime, where you're feeling tired around the clock, there is hope and you definitely can get sleep. And it's my goal to share with you information about early morning wakes, but also just share with you some resources that I have um, that would be helpful for you to ask questions in the future. I also wanted to gift one of you a 30 minute phone call giveaway. And so what I'm thinking is maybe I'll open it for a week and we will have it, um, those who download my free guide, it's four steps to help solve night wakings. It's generally for babies four months and above. However, there's a lot of good really sleep fundamentals within it. So if you download that free guide on my website, um, I will get a notification and then I will put your name into a draw for a 30 minute free uh, phone call. So this presentation is all about tackling early morning wakes. Now, I know a lot of you have some babies under four months, but early morning wakes are something that you may come into as your baby and your child grows and develops. Um, and so that's why I think it's really important to cover because it's one of those things that actually can be worked on. You don't have to have a early morning waker forever. <laughs> And this is information that I wish I had when my daughter was around the six, seven month range because she woke up early. Now, this is an overview. It looks like a lot, it's not, but I like to just be very clear with what we're gonna go over so you have a good understanding of what's gonna happen. So first I wanna set the expectations. What is an early morning wake and how can we define it? We're gonna look into checking the environment, the amount of daily sleep, checking the sleep schedule, checking sleep skills, a morning routine, and lastly, predictability of an early morning wake. And then at the very end, we're gonna save some time for questions and answer. So first off, <laughs> I want you to take a deep breath because there's gonna be a lot of information, but the biggest thing is I want you to know that all of this information is in my membership. And I'm gonna go into that in a little bit, but all of this information will be recorded as, as Ruth said. And then as well in my membership, these slides are taken from my early morning wakes video course. And so you'll have access to go into that if you choose to purchase the membership. So first off, starting with setting expectations. What is an early morning wake? And so I'm actually, uh, no, I won't ask questions just yet. An early morning wake is anything between four to 6 a.m. And so anything before 4 a.m. is actually considered a nighttime wake and anything after 6 a.m. is considered morning. And I know that's Probably tough to hear sometimes if you want your baby to sleep in until seven or eight, but this brings us to the natural wake up time. And so a natural wake up time for babies is actually between six to 8 a.m. And it's quite common for babies in the earlier months to be closer to that 6 a.m. range and that is totally normal. As babies get older and as your children reach into the toddler years, this is when you can start pushing that week out closer to the 7 a.m. range, but it does take time. Typically between months six or months four to 12, I typically recommend keeping that week between six to 6.30 just because it's easier on the baby. Now I've grouped these two together. So teething and regressions. Teething in itself may cause early morning wakes. And so this is something where you don't need to be worried about. We need to fix the teething early morning wakes. What happens is teething will affect the lightest parts of sleep. And the reason behind this is your baby is gonna be cutting a tooth, it's gonna to be painful. And when your baby's in a very light stage of sleep, it's just gonna be easier for them to be woken up. 
Now, teething is something that doesn't cause months upon months of early morning wakes. It will cause maybe a few days as your tooth erupts or as their tooth erupts, but it's not gonna cause months. So that's something that I just want you to think about if you're finding in the future you have early morning wakes and you think it's due to teething, it's just gonna be for a few days. It won't be happening for months. The next is a regression. So regressions in themselves actually cause early morning wakes as well. So they also affect the lightest parts of sleep. And this can be naps. So naps are quite a light part of sleep as well as early morning wakes. Now regressions typically last two weeks, maybe three weeks, but if it's a regression, there's some, not a lot you can do about it. It's just something that you need to wait out. Now, the next thing with illness, if your baby is sick, you need to love on them. You need to take care of them. It's something that you, early morning wakes will happen because they're sick and they're probably going to be awake around the clock, but don't be concerned because after your child gets better, then you can address those early morning wakes. We never want to address sleep um, or change sleep when a child is sick because the primary point of when a child is sick, we want to make sure that they're getting fed, they're getting um, hydrated, and they're getting enough sleep. Now, the last thing is hunger can often be a question. Is my baby hungry? And that's why they're waking in the nighttime. And so this would be a question for your pediatrician. Um, it's always good to make sure that your baby is following an appropriate waking, um, as well as that they're getting enough calories in the daytime. If you're ever concerned of that, I would always contact your pediatrician or a lactation consultant um, if you do have more questions. So this, honestly, out of all of this is probably my favorite because it's cheap and it's simple. <laughs> so checking the environment is probably one of the biggest factors in early morning weeks. Now, the first is darkness. And this is something that you can actually implement anytime. So after your baby is born, you can implement a dark sleeping space. It's not up until six to eight weeks that it's really important to implement that dark sleeping space. However, I would say all of you can start implementing that at nighttime because that's going to help with that day and that night confusion and let them know that in the daytime it's light and in the nighttime it's dark. With darkness though, what we're looking for is on a scale of one to 10, 10 being pitch black and one being daylight, we're actually looking for a 10. So if you can imagine, um, you go into your child's room, you close all the doors, all the windows, and you put your hand in front of your face, okay? It's called the hand test. You shouldn't be able to see your hand. Now, if you can see your hand, not a problem. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go around your room. You're gonna um, put black garbage bags over the windows, tin foil, put something underneath the door. You just want to cover up every light source possible. And the reason behind this is 5 a.m., 5.30, those early morning hours are the lightest stage of sleep. Okay, so your child has gone through a full night's sleep and now they have reduced sleep pressure. And we'll talk about sleep pressure in a bit. If your child's eye catches any source of light, so if there's like a crack from the window, something coming underneath the door, it's going to actually cause them to wake up. So by blackening out the full room, even like smoke detectors, sound machine lights, it's going to be extremely helpful. The next is noise. So when an early morning wake happens, we want to look at, is there any noise happening around that time? Now, noise could be something as much as like maybe your spouse is getting ready for work and they're taking a shower. Um, I've had clients who an air conditioner or a furnace kicks in and that actually caused the early morning wake. For my family, my husband gets ready the night before. He actually grinds his coffee the night before and he sets out his clothing to try to be as quiet as possible in the morning. And then the last out of the environmental um, options is the temperature. 
So it's actually recommended that you keep your child's room at a temperature between 18 to 21. And that might actually be surprising, but we as adults, as well as our children, sleep better in a cooler environment. So take a look at what your current thermostat is. And what you can even do is you can even buy these small like thermostats on Amazon and you pop it in your baby's room just below their crib to get a true idea of what the environment is like in their room. If you do have a monitor though, some of the monitors will have a indication of the temperature on it as well. If your child is struggling to fall asleep at nighttime and they are having those early morning wakes, this would be a really good option to look at as well. All right, so checking the daily amount of sleep. Now the AAP recommendations is the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I like to use their recommendations because they give you um, scientific based recommendations. Now, this, for example, here gives you the recommendations for infants four to 12, all the way up to children three to five. So if you have a toddler, you can look at this information as well, but we're gonna focus on that four to 12 month range, and then also the zero to four month range. So children or babies between the age of zero to three months need on average 16 to 20 hours of daily sleep. Now, we don't look necessarily at nighttime or daytime for this age because they're kind of sleeping around the clock. So, but we're looking for the 16 to 20 hours of sleep. Now, once we hit the three month mark, we're aiming for anywhere between 16 to 18 hours. And then once you hit that four month mark to 12 month, we're looking for 12 to 16 hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. The important thing here though, is that when you're calculating your child's sleep, you're looking at the sleep amounts for the daytime sleep as well as the nighttime sleep. Now, if your child is getting too much daytime sleep, it's actually gonna pull away from that nighttime sleep. And the first place that it will pull away from is those early morning hours. So that's why it's really important to look at the daytime sleep and make sure your child is getting enough. This is a chart here for daytime sleep amounts. Now, I don't have anything for before months. And the reason behind that is, like I said, your child is sleeping kind of around the clock. Um, so you don't necessarily need to monitor how many daytime hours they're getting. We want to make sure that they're getting the total amount of sleep. Once your child hits around four months of age, we're looking for three and a half to four and a half hours of daytime sleep and then 11 and a half to 12 hours at nighttime. Now for a five to six month old, we're dropping the sleep a little bit. So you're looking for three to four hours of sleep. Keep in mind, these are general recommendations, but they're just a good guide to go off of. Now next, the nighttime sleep. Sorry, I meant to say generally 11 to 12 hours of sleep at nighttime is what we're aiming for. If your child's getting over 12 hours of sleep at nighttime and things are going okay, I wouldn't change anything. But typically we recommend 11 to 12 hours at nighttime and then the specified amount during the day. And ideally that will add up to the total amount in the 24 hour period. So the next is checking the sleep schedule. So there's a few different things here that we want to check if you're struggling with early morning wakes. Now, a baby who is overtired is often going to be cranky. They're going to have a difficult time falling asleep at nighttime. You might actually have um, nighttime wakes before midnight. And so one of you asked a question about waking up an hour after going down for sleep. This is often a sign of being overtired. Babies who are overtired might actually look like they're becoming hyperactive. They might arch their backs, they might cry a lot. And these are all signs that you just wanna try shifting your baby's bedtime 15 to 20 minutes earlier. Okay, a baby who is undertired is going to be a baby who may not have enough sleep pressure before going down. Now, when I say the word sleep pressure, I want to talk about it just to make sure you have a good understanding of what it means. So sleep pressure 
is also called homeostatic sleep drive. Don't worry about that term. All you need to know is that the pressure that builds up in our body, so in your baby's body, as our awake time increases, is sleep pressure. So the longer your child is awake, the more sleep pressure they have. To give you an example, let's say your baby was awake for two hours, okay, versus a baby who is awake for three hours. A baby who is awake for two hours is going to have less sleep pressure than the baby who's awake for three hours. So as mentioned before, a baby who is overtired probably has too much sleep pressure, whereas a baby that is undertired has not enough sleep pressure. Both of these, it's confusing because both of these can actually cause early morning wakes because the undertired is gonna make it difficult for that baby to fall back asleep in those early morning hours for them to connect the sleep cycles. Whereas a baby that is undertired, they're gonna be done sleeping. At five in the morning, they're gonna be like, I've had enough sleep for the day. I don't have enough sleep pressure to push through that last sleep cycle. Now, I always like to add this one in here that bedtime is too late. And the reason behind this is it's just easiest for us as moms to kind of get our head around. We're putting our baby to bed too late and this may be causing those early morning wakes. So if this is happening, the easiest strategy is to try shifting bedtime 10 to 15 minutes early and holding it for like three to four nights, okay? So if you have a baby that's sensitive to sleep, try shifting 10 minutes earlier, holding it and seeing what's happen happening. It takes our baby's bodies three, four, five days to get used to a new change. And so that's why I always recommend holding the change for four to five days. And then what you can do is you can try shifting it earlier again. I always like to shift earlier first and then you can shift later. So always err on the side of not enough sleep before erring on the side of too much sleep. Now, the last thing here is the age appropriate schedule. It's really important to make sure that your child is following an age appropriate schedule because I've actually worked with a number of clients that once we change the daytime schedule as well as the nighttime bedtime, sleep actually comes into place, okay? Based on how old your baby is, they're going to be taking a set amount of naps. Now, I'm not going to go through this today, but I do have resources on how many naps your child needs to take, when the transitions happen, all in my membership. The next is checking on sleep skills. And I want to preface this with, if you have a baby before four months, so if you have a baby four months and under, you do not need to work on independent sleep skills. Um, until you hit the 16 week mark or four months of age, you are gonna do whatever you can do to get your baby to sleep and it's totally okay. This was my biggest tip from a sleep consultant that we used five years ago, was that in those first four months, you really wanna enjoy your baby, okay? It is okay to rock your baby to sleep. It's okay to nurse your baby to sleep. It's okay to do all of the things. Now, there are different methods of getting your baby to sleep that are gonna be harder to remove. Oh, is there a question? Joanne's just saying that is so great to hear, Alyssa. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, now, there are going to be things that you're going to do. So for example, nursing to sleep, that might be something that gives you issues in the future, but I don't want you to worry about it because there is enough going on in those first at, at least six to eight weeks of life, right? You're recovering from childbirth. Maybe you're recovering from an adoption process or fostering. Um, you are recovering, okay? You were sleep deprived and you just need to enjoy your baby. Now, with checking on sleep skills, once again, this is for babies four months and above, we're looking for drowsy but awake, okay? So I want you to look for that and I want you to shift your thinking to fully awake. And I know that sounds kind of funny, but the reason behind this, why we wanna make sure your babe is going down fully awake for both nap and nighttime and the reason behind this is when we have a baby that's going 
to sleep at bedtime, drowsy but awake, asleep already, and then we place them in the crib, they don't have the ability to get through that sleep cycle on their own. So they're actually starting to get into the stage one sleep. Don't worry about that term. They're just getting into that first stage of sleep with your help. So what's going to happen is they're actually going to need that help in the future. So this is an example of a sleep cycle. It just gives you a good idea of what it looks like. So if you look at the lightest blue color, it talks about beginning to fall asleep. That is stage one sleep. Then we go into a lighter to deeper sleep, a deep sleep, coming out of sleep, and a brief awakening. Basically what this chart is, is it shows the three different stages of sleep. So stage one, two, and three. Stage one is beginning to fall asleep. Stage two is you're on your way to sleep. And then stage three is the deep and restorative sleep we're looking for, followed by REM sleep. Okay, so that's rapid eye movement. It's when your baby's dreaming. And then after that, there's a brief awakening. The point with this slide is I want to get across that every baby wakes up after a sleep cycle. The main point is if you are struggling with nighttime wakes, if you are struggling with early morning wakes, ask yourself if your baby is able to put themselves to sleep on their own, or do they need help with that? The biggest thing here is that sleep is a learned skill, okay? And it's a choice that you get to make for your child. No one gets to tell you what you get to do with your own baby, but I want you to know that this is an option if you choose to go this route. Now, sleep cycles, they repeat every 30 to 45 minutes. And if you have a short chronic catnapper, you probably know how long your baby's sleep cycle is. I've had many clients who mentioned to me that they're like 30 minutes long. They can time it to the T. Okay. Now, self-soothing, basically what this is, is it's teaching independent sleep skills. And all this means is that your baby has the ability to go from fully awake to fully asleep all on their own. And like I said, this is for babies four months and up because when you have a baby under four months, they need help falling asleep. Um, you can always try to put your baby down by themselves and see if they can fall asleep on their own, but I wouldn't expect it under four months, okay? Now, self-soothing, this can take the form of many different methods. And I know one of you mentioned cry it out. That's actually not a, me um, a method that I use with my families unless they ask for it. There is a number of other methods that you can use that have more of a parent present approach, okay, either in the room or out of the room, and there's more gentler methods out there. But the whole idea behind it is that your child is learning to put themselves to sleep on their own, and this is going to really help that early morning week if it's an issue. Now, the last thing here is the last feed of the day. This is something that you can actually even start if you have a baby under four months. So that last feed of the day, I recommend moving it to the beginning of the sleep routine, okay? So having a bedtime routine is really important. And if you can move that last feed to this beginning of the routine, this helps to separate that feed to sleep association. And it also helps to keep your baby fully awake before bedtime. So the next one, we have two more and then we can head into questions. The next one is checking the morning routine. Now I'm sure many of you heard of a bedtime routine. It's extremely important to have a bedtime routine. But when we're talking about early morning weeks, I want you guys to focus on a morning routine. And what this looks like is, okay, we're gonna focus on incentive to wake. So if you're struggling with early morning wakes, is there an incentive for your child to wake? So for example, do they get fed right away? Do they get brought out of bed and they get maybe screen time? Do they get to come and be with you at five o'clock in the morning? That is a really big incentive for our children to wake, especially toddlers. Now, the next thing is with a morning routine, I want you to try to think about delaying that first feed of the day. I'm not asking you to delay it at a time. You can start by five minutes, but I would recommend delaying that first feed of the day 10 to 15 minutes after your baby wakes up. And once again, this is for four months and older. 
And the reason why we want to delay that is because feeding will actually cause a biological response in our baby's bodies. And so by delaying that feed, it's just going to help them to not be used to being fed as soon as they get out of the crib. The next is delaying stimulation. Okay, so delaying any kind of stimulation until at least the six o'clock mark. So when I mentioned before, an early morning wake is between 4 and 6 a.m., we want to delay the stimulation. So delay being with your baby, um, delay any type of light that's going to reduce the production of melatonin as long as you can. Now, if you have a baby that's waking up at 5 and you're like, I cannot delay it till 6, baby steps, right? Try to delay it 5 minutes each day until you push it out. The next is an exaggerated wake up. So this is really, really big for early morning wakes. And I often tell this to actually all of my clients, when your baby wakes up in the morning, be excited. <laughs> and I have been there, I have been tired, sleep deprived, and that is the last thing you want to do. But the reason behind this is if you have an exaggerated morning wake up, it's going to show your baby that this is an okay time to wake. So you're basically looking at making it an event. You want your baby to know that this is the time to get up and all other times are nighttime, okay? So when your baby wakes up in the morning, and this is something you can do all the ages, you flip those lights on, open up the blinds, and you say, good morning, Sophia, and you'd be super excited. And it'll be very helpful for them to cue that this is a good time to wake. And then the last thing, so this doesn't apply to babies, but a toddler clock is extremely helpful. So maybe to the two and a half year olds on here, um, this would be super helpful for early morning wakes. There's different toddler clock options. I'm not gonna go into them, but I just want you to know that as your children age, this is an option. What a toddler clock does is it has a light indication that your child can come out of the room for the day. Now, our last slide um, is on checking predictability. What's important about this is when we're looking at predictability, so once again, with an early morning wake, if it's been happening a while, we want to know, is it a habit or is it just something that's maybe a regression or teething? And the way that we're going to look at this is if an early morning wake is jumping around, so one day 4.30, the next day 6, the next day 5.30, the next day 5.15. That wake is jumping around. So that tells me as a consultant that the early morning wake isn't a set habit yet. Now, if the early morning wake is consistent, so you're seeing 5.30, 5.30, 5.35, 5.25, you're seeing something very consistent every day. This means that it's likely become a habit and you might need to use a different approach to pushing it out. So this is called the wake to sleep approach. I'm not going to go into it on here, but I want you to keep it in the back of your mind. If you have gone through all of these other options and you are finding out that your baby is just not pushing their early morning wake out or your toddler is not pushing that wake out, there is a method that we can use and you can do at home to help push out a wake that is more a consistent habit in your baby's body. So before we get into questions, I just wanted to quickly touch on this membership that I'm talking about. Um, so this, all of these slides, and they're actually in a mini course series. So I've created a early morning wakes um, mini course series. It's created seven different videos. So it goes through all these seven different sections. And that's why I wanted you guys to take a breath because this is all recorded somewhere. And there's actually, it's quite interactive. So there's homework after each different video of the seven different videos, and it gives you homework to work on at home. So you can work your way through all of these. What the Your Sleep Story membership is, basically it's education, community, and support and it's for ages zero to five. And the main reason why I have created this is for moms like you. Um, when I first had my daughter, I did not know that sleep consulting was a thing. I did not know anything about sleep and I just felt extremely overwhelmed. So I've created this membership just to be a place where it's supportive 
And basically there's two different options. There's a basic membership and a premium. The main difference is that the premium membership gives you the, a monthly Zoom call. So think about this, but we get to chat as a group on monthly Zoom. So the Q&A after is very similar to what I offer and it's $22 a month. Whereas both memberships give you that monthly video content. So I upload videos every month. This month it's on night weaning. So when and how to wean your baby's feeds at nighttime. And every week I do a weekly Q and A on Facebook. And then there's also the Facebook community. So the main points of the membership, everyone's welcome. It's for parents zero to five with children zero to five. It's safe and it's a judgment-free community. That's the biggest thing is I wanna make it a safe community so you can ask your questions and all questions are welcome. It's support when you need it. So it's a monthly membership. If you join for one month, ask your questions and then you don't need it anymore, you can jump back in in two months or you can stay for as long as you want. And the biggest thing is it's monthly payments. So you pay as you go, $12 a month or the 22 and you can ask your questions. Thank you so much and we'll get into the Q&A.